Once upon a time, in the early 18th century, a great conflict loomed over Europe. It all began with the passing of Charles II, the last of the Spanish Habsburgs, leaving behind a throne without an heir. This triggered the War of the Spanish Succession, a clash born from the dispute over who would inherit the vast Spanish Empire. At the heart of the matter were two powerful families, the Bourbons and the Habsburgs. Each laid claim to the throne through intricate dynastic ties. The stage was set for a dramatic struggle to determine the fate of Spain and its vast territories. In the labyrinth of royal marriages and alliances, the lines of succession grew tangled. From the union of Philip III of Spain emerged two daughters, Anne, who wed Louis XIII of France, and Maria Anna, who married the future Habsburg Emperor Ferdinand III. Their offspring further complicated matters as they married into both the Bourbon and Habsburg lines. However, it was the daughter of Margarita Teresa, Maria Antonia, whose son Joseph Ferdinand emerged as a potential heir to Charles II. Yet, the legitimacy of his claim was challenged as both the Bourbons and the Habsburgs pressed their own rights to the throne. As tensions escalated, European powers weighed in. England and the Netherlands, fearing French dominance, rallied against the Bourbon claim. In a bid to prevent a complete takeover by either side, a partition treaty was proposed, aiming to divide the Spanish Empire among the contenders. But fate had its own plans. With the death of Joseph Ferdinand, the situation grew even more precarious. A second partition treaty failed to find acceptance, leading Charles II to make a decisive will in favor of Philip, Duc d'Anjou, of the Bourbon lineage. As Charles II breathed his last, Europe held its breath. Louis XIV faced a critical choice. Accept the will and risk war with the Habsburgs, or reject it and face opposition from England and the Netherlands. In a bold move, he opted for the former, ushering in a new era of conflict. But it was not just a struggle between dynasties, it became a clash of nations. Louis XIV's arrogance and provocations drew England and the Netherlands into the fray, expanding the conflict far beyond a mere dispute over succession. As the War of the Spanish Succession unfolded across Europe, it brought with it a complexity that mirrored the intricate dance of court politics. This conflict wasn't just a clash of swords, it was a strategic symphony played out on multiple fronts. In the early 18th century, warfare was a delicate balance of maneuver and countermaneuver. Unlike later conflicts characterized by brute force, generals of the time treaded carefully, mindful of the difficulty in replenishing their armies. Yet, amidst this cautious approach, one figure stood out. John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough. His bold strategies often clashed with the more conventional tactics favored by his allies, notably Prince Eugene of Savoy. Across the fields of battle in the Low Countries, the Rhine, the Danube, northern Italy, and the Iberian Peninsula, armies clashed and maneuvered in a complex ballet of war. The conflict was not merely about seizing territory, but about containing and outmaneuvering the enemy. In the year 1701, the stage was set for conflict to erupt. French troops seized Spanish fortresses in the Spanish Netherlands, signaling the beginning of hostilities. Yet, the initial thrust of the war was primarily between Louis XIV and Emperor Leopold I, with northern Italy emerging as the main theater of operations. Prince Eugene, with his imperial army, executed a daring march through neutral territory, catching the French off guard. Despite numerical inferiority, Eugene's forces pressed on, forcing the French to retreat. Marshal Nicolas Catenet, commanding the French, found himself outmaneuvered and outpaced, leading to his replacement by Francois de Neuville, Duc de Villeroy. But the tide of battle was not easily turned. Villeroy's attempts to regain the offensive were met with sharp defeat at Chiari, leaving imperial forces in control of much of the Duchy of Mantua. In a daring raid on Cremona, Eugene captured Villeroy himself, further bolstering the imperial cause. As the winter of 1701-02 descended, the wheels of war continued to turn. The support of the Dukes of Modena and Guastalla swung in favor of the Emperor, further complicating the already tangled web of alliances and ambitions. As the year 1702 dawned, the war for the Spanish succession expanded its grip across Europe, drawing in reluctant allies and setting the stage for a continent-wide conflict. Diplomatic maneuvers had transformed the struggle into a grand European affair. France and Spain, bolstered by the hesitant support of Portugal and Savoy, found themselves facing off against a coalition led by the Emperor, with the United Provinces, England, Prussia, and various German princes in tow. 
the opening moves of this continental chess match saw little decisive action. In Italy, Prince Eugene found himself challenged by Louis-Joseph, Duc de Vaudome, yet managed to hold his ground and harass the French forces. At sea, an English expedition against Cadiz faltered, but the destruction of the Spanish silver fleet at Vigo Harbor provided a glimmer of success. In the Low Countries, Marlborough, the master tactician, marshaled his forces near Nijmegen, striking southwest towards Deest. Despite outmaneuvering the French and reaching their fortified lines first, Marlborough's Dutch allies hesitated to press the attack, content with the perceived relief of the immediate threat to the United Provinces. However, the campaign on the Rhine held a surprise in store. The Imperial Army, led by Louis William I of Baden, crossed the Rhine and threatened Alsace, catching the French off guard. Maximilian II Emmanuel of Bavaria, previously neutral, openly declared for France, altering the strategic landscape dramatically. Villar, now in command, pursued the retreating imperial forces, crossing the Rhine and defeating them at Friedlingen. The stage was set for the major campaigns of the years to come, as Europe braced itself for the full fury of war. In the tumultuous year of 1703, the winds of fortune began to favor the French, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the Allies. Amidst the ebb and flow of battle, minor victories dotted the landscape. In the Mediterranean, the English fleet's blockade of Toulon convinced Portugal to abandon its uneasy alliance with France and join forces with the maritime powers. The tides turned further on the Lower Rhine, where Marlborough's forces invaded Cologne and captured Bonn, pushing the French back between the Meuse and the Rhine. Yet, in Italy, suspicions brewed. Vaudome, wary of his ally Victor Amadeus II, the Duke of Savoy, demanded concessions that strained their fragile partnership. Eventually, Victor Amadeus, feeling the weight of French demands, switched sides, aligning with the Emperor. But his late defection did little to alter the course of events in Italy that season. The real threat, however, loomed over Vienna. Villar, crossing the Rhine at Kale, joined forces with the Elector of Bavaria near Ulm, presenting a formidable challenge to the Emperor. The cautious approach of the Elector hindered their advance, delaying any direct assault on Vienna as they sought to secure their communications through Tyrol. Despite initial setbacks, the possibility of a siege on Vienna remained. Louis of Baden and General Styron positioned their armies to defend the capital, yet their failure to unite left vulnerabilities. Villar seized the opportunity, attacking Styron and emerging victorious at Hochstadt near Blenheim, a testament to his strategic brilliance. But discord brewed within the French ranks. The elector's reluctance to press forward incited tension, leading to Villar's recall. Meanwhile, on the Rhine, minor French successes failed to compensate for the cautious strategy employed on the Danube. As the year drew to a close, the pendulum of war swung once more, leaving both sides poised for the tumultuous battles yet to come. As the curtains rose on the campaign season of 1704, the stage was set for a decisive showdown in the heart of Europe. The threat of the French and Bavarian armies to Vienna loomed large. In April, as strong French forces converged near Dillingen, Hope seemed dim. Louis of Baden's attempts to thwart their advance faltered, leaving Vienna vulnerable to their impending strike. Meanwhile, Eugene, replacing Styrum on the Danube front, faced an uphill battle against overwhelming odds. Yet, amidst the gloom, a beacon of strategic brilliance emerged in the form of Marlborough. Recognizing the need to relieve Vienna without leaving Holland exposed, Marlborough devised a daring plan. Feigning a move to flank Villeroy's forces, he stealthily crossed the Rhine, making his way southeast to join forces with Louis of Baden near Ulm. With Eugene containing Tallard, Marlborough and Louis of Baden launched a swift assault, seizing Donauwerth and forcing the French and Bavarians to retreat. As Marlborough positioned his forces between his enemies and Vienna, the balance of power shifted. The French response was swift but disjointed. Villeroy's belated realization of Marlborough's maneuver prompted a hasty southward march to join forces with Tallard. Yet, Tallard's delay in capturing Fillingen allowed Eugene to rendezvous with Marlborough at Hochstadt, tipping the scales further in favor of the Allies. With Ingolstadt under siege and the French and Bavarians moving north to attack Eugene, Marlborough raced to his aid. The culmination of their efforts came at the Battle of Blenheim on August 13, 1704, a resounding victory that shattered the myth of French invincibility and secured the Danube front. Meanwhile, developments in Spain and the Mediterranean brought further encouragement to the Emperor and his allies. Portugal's alliance strengthened their position, 
paving the way for an invasion of Spain itself. Though progress on land was limited, English naval victories at Gibraltar and Velez Malaga gave them command of the Mediterranean, altering the course of the war. By the year's end, the tide had turned decisively. Vienna was safe, the French invasion thwarted, and the Elector of Bavaria forced into exile. As Europe braced itself for the trials yet to come, the echoes of victory rang loud and clear. As the year 1705 unfolded, Marlborough's grand plans to strike France itself from the Rhine faltered in the face of logistical challenges and the shifting political landscape. With the death of Emperor Leopold I in May, imperial forces were diverted to ensure the smooth election of his successor, Joseph I, leaving Marlborough to redirect his efforts to the Netherlands. Despite piercing the French lines at Tirelemont, Marlborough found his ambitions curtailed by the cautiousness of his Dutch allies. In Italy, Eugene's relentless push against the French along the Oglio River provided respite for Savoy, where Turin faced French siege. The turning point came in July 1705, as Eugene orchestrated a daring maneuver, swiftly crossing the Po to join forces with the Duke of Savoy at Villa Stallone. Together, they lifted the siege of Turin, securing a crucial victory in northern Italy. Meanwhile, in the Netherlands, Marlborough's fortunes soared. At the Battle of Ramillies in May 1706, he dealt a crushing blow to the French under Villeroy, pushing them back and capturing strategic strongholds. Antwerp, Ghent, Bruges, and Audenarda fell rapidly, strengthening Marlborough's hold on the Spanish Netherlands. The impact of Marlborough's triumph reverberated across Europe. Vaudon, recalled from Italy to replace the disgraced Villeroy, found himself facing a resurgent Marlborough, while French forces on the Rhine were stretched thin to reinforce the faltering front in the Netherlands. In Spain, the imperial forces and their allies achieved notable successes. Relief came to Gibraltar in March 1705, while advances into Estremadura forced the French to abandon Andalusia. English naval prowess, under Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, facilitated the capture of Montjuich and Barcelona, tipping Catalonia and Valencia into the arms of the Archduke Charles. The decisive reversals experienced by France and its allies in 1706 prompted Louis XIV to seek peace. Yet, his overtures, offering Spain and Spanish America to the Archduke Charles while retaining key territories, founded on the refusal of the English and imperial governments to partition the Spanish Empire. As Europe stood at the brink of peace negotiations, the fortunes of war continued to shift, leaving nations poised on the edge of uncertainty. The year 1707 brought a series of setbacks for the imperial and maritime powers, as the tides of war shifted once again across Europe. In Germany, the Emperor's precarious situation was exacerbated by Charles XII of Sweden's incursion into Saxony, threatening Vienna itself. Shortages of troops and the reluctance of German princes to commit further strained the imperial forces. Though Charles XII's ambitions did not align with those of France, his presence diverted attention and resources away from the Netherlands, where Marlborough faced mounting challenges. On the Rhine, the death of Louis of Baden and the subsequent command of Margrave Charles Ernest of Brandenburg Bayreuth weakened the imperial forces. Villar capitalized on this vulnerability, seizing the lines of Stolhofen and raiding Swabia before the arrival of George, Elector of Hanover, to bolster the defense. In Spain, the Allies suffered significant losses as internal discord led to the disastrous Battle of Almansa in April 1707. Galway and the Archduke Charles's disagreement left them divided, resulting in defeat and the loss of Aragon, Valencia, and Mercia. Eugene's planned attack on Toulon faltered due to delays and lack of support, culminating in the scuttling of the French fleet in the harbor. Despite these setbacks, Louis XIV sought an end to the war. The Convention of Milan in March 1707 signaled France's withdrawal from northern Italy. However, Peace negotiations were hindered by England's refusal to compromise on the Spanish inheritance, leading to the resumption of hostilities in May 1709. As the conflict entered its later stages, Marlborough's strategic acumen and the continued successes of the Allied forces reshaped the balance of power. The Battle of Audenarda in July 1708 saw the defeat of the French under Vaudam, followed by the successful siege of Lille, forcing France to retreat from West Flanders. The weakness of France became apparent in the peace negotiations of March 1709, where Louis XIV was willing to cede the entire Spanish inheritance. However, English and Dutch insistence on stringent terms, including the surrender of the Spanish throne by Philip V, led to the rejection of the proposed peace and the resumption of hostilities. As the war persisted, the stage was set for a final showdown, with the fate of Europe hanging in the balance. 
Amidst the fading embers of late 1709, the resumption of hostilities breathed new life into the conflict. As the French bolstered their ranks under the seasoned Villar, Marlborough, ever the strategist, sought to exploit the English fleet's naval prowess to strike along the French coast. Yet, his unorthodox plan failed to sway his cautious allies, leading to a siege of Tournay and later Mons. Villar, sensing his chance, advanced to meet his opponents at Malplaquet, where a brutal clash ensued on September 11, 1709. Though Marlborough emerged victorious, the toll was steep, with casualties mounting on both sides. The fall of Mons in October provided some respite, but the campaign had exacted a heavy toll on the maritime powers and the empire. In other theaters, the imperial forces faltered. The Duke of Savoy's failure to cooperate hampered efforts in Dauphiné, while a defeat near Basel further dimmed hopes of success. In Spain, Galway's Portuguese forces proved unreliable, prompting their replacement with German troops from Italy. Despite English successes in Menorca, the Bourbons tightened their grip on Spanish soil, seizing Tortosa, Denia, and Alicante. By 1710, weariness pervaded all sides of the conflict. The Dutch, weary of war, signed treaties with England, securing their interests in the Spanish Netherlands. Even in England, voices grew for a compromise, with some willing to entertain the idea of Philip V retaining parts of the Spanish Empire. However, staunch opposition from the Emperor and the Duke of Savoy, along with Philip's resolve and successes in Spain, thwarted attempts at negotiation. Peace talks in Gertrudenberg faltered as each party clung to its demands. Louis XIV's offer of subsidies to oust Philip from Spain fell flat as the maritime powers insisted on French involvement. Marlborough, weakened by political turmoil in England, lacked the strength to sway his allies. By July 1710, the prospects of peace seemed remote, leaving Europe entrenched in the throes of war. As the year 1710 unfolded, the tides of war continued to shift, bringing both victories and setbacks to the embattled powers. In Spain, Starnberg's modest successes at Almanara and Saragossa momentarily raised hopes, leading to the brief occupation of Madrid. However, imperial forces soon faced defeat at Briuega and Villa Viciosa, allowing Philip V to solidify his grip on Spain once more, confining imperial forces to Catalonia. Yet, it was not on the fields of battle, but within the political corridors of England, that the true turning point of the war emerged. The conduct of the Whig government faced mounting criticism, fueled by perceived missed opportunities and unpopular treaties. Marlborough, once a towering figure, found himself sidelined as the Tory faction gained ascendance in Parliament. The death of Emperor Joseph I in April 1711 further altered the course of events. With the ascension of Joseph's brother, the Archduke Charles, to the Habsburg realms, the prospect of continuing the war to place him on the Spanish throne became untenable for England and the Dutch. Amidst these shifting dynamics, negotiations for peace gained traction. Marlborough, in his final act of military prowess, broke Villar defensive lines in the Netherlands. However, by the year's end, Marlborough faced dismissal from his command. Formal peace discussions commenced in Utrecht in January 1712, marking a significant milestone in the quest for resolution. Despite initial complexities, including the deaths of key French heirs and the renunciation of claims to the French throne by Philip V, negotiations progressed. By May 1712, Philip formally relinquished his claim to the French throne, paving the way for further diplomatic breakthroughs. Bolingbroke, leading the English negotiations, displayed a ruthless determination to bring the war to an end, even at the expense of his allies. In November, Philip's renunciation was ratified by the Spanish Cortes, followed by his brother Charles, Duke de Berry. Louis XIV's acknowledgement of these renunciations in March 1713 marked a significant step towards peace. Ultimately, the peace terms, though advantageous to England, were more favorable to the Bourbons than previous proposals. Louis XIV, once willing to pay for the expulsion of his grandson from Spain, now conceded Naples, Sicily, and Milan to Philip V, signaling the beginning of the end for the War of the Spanish Succession. With the signing of the Treaties of Utrecht, a long chapter of conflict drew to a close, though the process was not without its complexities and delays. On April 11, 1713, a series of treaties were concluded in Utrecht, marking a significant step towards peace. France, seeking to end the hostilities, reached agreements with England, Holland, Prussia, Portugal, and Savoy. These treaties delineated territorial exchanges and recognized various claims and titles. 
France recognized England's Protestant succession and conceded territories such as Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and Gibraltar. The Dutch secured territorial gains in Gelderland and fortresses in the Spanish Netherlands as a barrier against future French invasions. Prussia saw its royal title acknowledged, while Savoy gained rule over Sicily and Nice. Portugal secured sovereignty over regions along the Amazon River. Yet, the peace process was far from swift. Spain's treaties with its adversaries were delayed, with negotiations extending over months. Spain ceded Gibraltar and Menorca to England and promised Sicily to Savoy. An exclusive trade agreement, the Asiento, granted Britain rights to supply Spanish colonies with enslaved individuals. Delays persisted, frustrating Louis XIV, particularly regarding negotiations with the Dutch and modifications sought by Philip of Spain. Eventually, on July 13, 1713, Spain concluded its treaty, ceding territories and establishing commercial agreements with England. However, the emperor remained entangled in conflict, facing setbacks such as the defeat of Eugene at Denen and the loss of strategic territories on the Rhine. Eventually, peace was brokered with France in Rostadt on March 7, 1714, followed by the Treaty of Baden on September 7, 1714. Though the emperor technically remained at war with Spain until 1720, the treaties of Utrecht laid the groundwork for stability in southern Europe for years to come. Despite the valorous efforts of military leaders like Marlborough and Eugene, the resolution of the war was ultimately shaped by domestic politics and the unforeseen death of Emperor Joseph I. In the aftermath, Philip V retained much of his inheritance, including Spain and its American possessions, despite territorial concessions such as the Spanish Netherlands and various islands. Thus concluded twelve years of conflict, with the political landscape of Europe reshaped by treaties negotiated in the wake of bloody battles like Blenheim, Ramillies, Audenarda, and Malplaquet.